Praise the Lord. Rise up and prepare ourselves for the Bible study tonight. That the Lord will speak to your heart. You'll have the attitude of a real child in the family of God. The attitude of respect and honor in the house of God, in the presence of the Heavenly Father. That the word he teaches and the words he, bring, he brings out will enrich your life, enrich your soul, as we pay maximum attention to the word we are hearing tonight. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. That God will help you to have the attitude and the respect and the honor for God the Father. More than you have for your earthly father. More than you have for the earthly authority over you. At home, at school, your place of work. That you have greater respect and greater honor for the God of heaven. That the spirit that controls you will not be the spirit of Antichrist, but will be the spirit of Christ. And as he lives to please the Father, so it will be your desire, your ambition, and it will be your commitment and consecration. That you have that same attitude of Christ, our Lord and Savior, giving honor and glory unto Him, wanting to please Him in every thought, in every action, in every behavior, and wanting to have honor for His Word, because He exalts His Word above His name. So you want to pray? That the Spirit of the Living God will search you and see that your mind, your heart, is focused on His Word, on His will. You'll not be an hypocritical Pharisee that brought condemnation on themselves because they profess that they knew God, but in action and lifestyle. They acted and behaved like pagans, heathens, atheists. That they didn't actually believe in the presence of God where they were. Hearing the word, believing the word, accepting the word brings blessing upon us. The condition of your heart will tell how much of the word you are learning. How much of the word... Sinking in, soaking in, receiving. How much of the word will control your life? How you receive is an indication of how much the word is going to work effectually, effectively in your heart. The God will also guide you and help you. There will be no wandering thought. There will be no insensitivity. To this word that God himself sent it to us as his children, members of his family. That you not become so familiar with the Bible study. That the familiarity then makes you superficial. That you'll take the word and receive the word. Like the word is of old. Like the people of old accepted the word. They rejoiced at hearing the word. They delighted in the word. They allowed the word to search them out. And the word to burn everything like chaff out of their lives. They allowed the word to have the ministry of a hammer. Breaking hard rocks in pieces. Allow the word to encourage them, to comfort them, to lift them up, to stir them up. To lead them and turn them in the right direction. They allow the word to be a light in their pathway. Let's have the same attitude. So that the Lord will keep on blessing us. The fellowship around his table as we eat and drink in his presence. So that the thoughts of our hearts, the meditation of our hearts, the response 
to his word. As we learn, be acceptable unto him. And he'll find us faithful, dependable, loyal, obedient, God-pleasing children of God. There's power in the word. And the word that goes forth from him shall not come back until it accomplishes. Except it accomplishes that for which the Lord had sent his word. Bring your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole personality to the word. Do not allow any private, personal sin that may be on your mind, on your heart to disturb you, to sway you, or to make you go astray from full concentration on the word he teaches us tonight. Pray that God will so give you such love for the truth. That the truth then will take over your life and so work in a supernatural way in your life as the word works in such a spiritual way in the lives of the people that first heard before it came to you. The Lord is willing to bless those who come to him. With a willing heart, with a ready heart, and those who look up to him as the almighty God, those who exalt him as the most high God, and they have that honor, respect, reverence for him. He looks at the condition of the heart of all the people that approach him, those who come to his presence, and when he sees people that honor him, that exalt him, that adore, that, are, that worship him, that do not have any distraction, any other ambition to lead them this way or that way. He delights in blessing such people. In Jesus' name we pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you because even though you are great, so great and so high, that you would have been unapproachable except for the Lord Jesus Christ who became the mediator between you and us. And because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, forgiving us and cleansing us and blotting out the handwriting that was against us, because of that we can approach you and come in your presence without any fear and without consciousness of worthlessness. Lord, we pray as you accept also, we'll exalt you and worship you in spirit and in truth in Jesus' name. And as we come to study and watch together tonight, we pray that you open the pages of the scriptures to everyone, and this one will benefit, this word will benefit everyone in Jesus' name. Save those who need salvation. Sanctify those who are saved. And fill with the Holy Ghost the people who are saved and sanctified and committed to serving you and evangelizing their community in Jesus' name. Strengthen your people and make us steady in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. The respect we ought to have for you, the honor we ought to have for you, the exaltation, the worship, the adoration we ought to give to you. More than we respect and honor people here on earth, help us, Lord, to give to you in Jesus' name. We pray that you help us not to have the spirit of the world, the spirit of disregard and disobedience and disrespect for the Most High God. Help us, Lord, that will not have the mind or the spirit or the attitude of the Antichrist, but have the attitude that will follow you steadily all through our lives with honor, respect, and glory in Jesus' name. Help us, both young and old, both children and youths and children and fathers and mothers to understand that when we come to the presence of the Lord, you want to bless us. And Lord, we pray, we'll put ourselves in that spiritual condition of humility so that your blessings will flow into every one of our lives in Jesus' name. 
Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We are sitting down now. We come back to the study of Daniel. And we're looking at Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, already we have seen the vision, the revelation that God gave unto Daniel. But God gave him this revelation, this vision, in the form of symbols, illustrations. You could almost say a parable. And he needed interpretation. He needed understanding. For the benefit of those who might not have been here when we studied the first two uh, studies in chapter 7. I'm going to just read to you from verse 4. We're looking at Daniel chapter 7 verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plugged, and it was lifted up from the earth. And then it says, and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to each. Then it was made to see the kings of the world in their beastly and brute nature. And he saw them like animals, like beasts. And the first one he saw was a lion that actually we have studied already represents the kingdom of the, ba of the Babylonians in verse 5. And behold, another beast is second, like a bear. And it raised up itself on one side, and it had through reefs in the mouths of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. That's the kingdom that came after the Babylonian Empire, the Middle Persian Empire, to destroy, to totally conquer the Babylonian Empire. That's why it says, Arise. Now get up and don't be afraid of the Babylonians and kill and devour and destroy much flesh. And then after that, a third one came in verse 6. After this, I beheld, and lo, like a, lo, like, like a leopard, lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to each. This is telling us that the third kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, arose and took over from the Middle Persian government and had dominion. Now that is going to get out of the way, we're going to have the fourth. In verse 7, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the rest deal with the feet of it and it was diverse different from all the beasts that were before it and it and it had ten horns i consider the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Those were the things that Daniel saw. When Daniel saw that, Daniel was a person who had interpreted the dreams for other people, had interpreted the visions of other people. In his own case, now he had his own vision, his own revelation. He needed interpretation. He needed understanding. But you understand that when he saw what was the interpretation of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 4 verse 19, the way he felt and the way he thought about it. Let Let's go to Daniel chapter 4 and let me just read verse 27. In verse 27, wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness. Daniel was not a person to just hear the word of God and leave it like that. He heard the word of God and he saw the interpretation of what was coming on the king. In fact, he had a sorrowful heart, a sad heart and he, he was actually kind of mourning for the king. Look at verse 19. Now then Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar was astonished. That means astonished and surprised and amazed for one hour and he thoughts troubled him. When he saw that vision, when he saw the interpretation of what had been given to Nebuchadnezzar, his thoughts troubled him. He knew that 
this king was going to go through a terrible, terrible problem. And let's look at chapter 8. In chapter 8, he saw another one, another vision, another, uh, another revelation. And then again, he had a good attitude. A good attitude, which is what the Lord is expecting we ought to have when you hear the word of God, when you see the revelation of the word of God, that you'll think about it, you'll meditate on it, and then you'll be able to take the right attitude. I'm looking at chapter 8 of uh, Daniel, in chapter, sorry, still chapter 7. In chapter 7, let's look at uh, verse 28. It says, either too is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me. He meditated on what he saw. And he said, my thoughts and my cogitations much troubled me. And my countenance changed in me. But I kept the matter in my heart. That's the attitude you ought to have when you hear the word of God. Look at chapter 8 now. In chapter 8, verse, uh, we're reading from verse 26 and verse 27. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true, wherefore shut thou of the vision, for it shall be for many days. Now comes the attitude, the sorrow. And the oppression that he had in the earth when he thought about what he saw, when he meditated on what he saw. And that's what the Lord is expecting of you and expecting of me. Not just to come to the Bible study and not just to read all these verses of Scripture and string everything together, but to think through and to meditate on what we're hearing so that the thought of that word, the meditation of that word will then have a great transforming impact in our lives. In chapter 8 verse 27 And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days after what I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision but none understood it. Other people did not understand what he had seen. But she understood because he thought about it. He meditated on what he had seen. And the Lord wants you to do the same. It is meditation on the word of God. The revealed prophetic truth that actually will have a changing effect. A transforming effect. A salutary effect upon the heart of the people. Without meditation... Everything we hear will look like we just gather up knowledge in the mind, in the head. And the knowledge in the head without meditation will not actually bring any fruit in our lives. Look at the importance of meditation on the word in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thou shalt meditate as we're looking at the book of the lord at the word of god at the revelation of the vision that has given to us is saying it shall not depart from thy mouth it's not just for the monday night or monday evening it's not just for one day in the week it even says over here thou shalt meditate therein Day and night, and thou shalt observe to do according to all that is written therein. It says that it's when you meditate on the word and you'll see the commandments in the word, the demand in the word, the challenge in the word, and then you'll be able to do as the Lord Himself has committed into your hand and commanded you. And then it says, It's only then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. We're looking at Psalm 1 verse 2. Psalm 1 verse 2. Let me start from verse 1. Blessed is a man. How do we get blessed? Our attitude to the word of God will show whether we'll be blessed or not. And you know the people of the world, they are not waiting for the blessings of God. They think they're sufficient by themselves. They think they can do everything, possess everything, go all the lanes and climb any mountain and descend any valley and achieve any success without God. That's why God is not in their thoughts. God is not in their mind. That's why they act in the world as if there were no God. But we know, we understand, if we're going to have success, if we're going to have any progress in life, we need God. 
We need his support. We need his help. We need his hand upon our lives. And without him, we are nothing. Because of that, that's why he speaks to us. And that's the reason why we meditate on the word. He says, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor seateth in the seat of his comfort, but his delight, his joy, his happiness, his desire, his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his Lord does he what does he do? Meditate how often day and night, not only Monday night. You know, uh, the, the reason why some people backslide is because they do not meditate on what they hear day and night. They do not think through on what they hear day and night. They are very uh, constant in the Bible study. They hear, they read, they learn. They might even understand what they have read that night, that Monday night. But because of the lack of meditation on the Word, there's no change in their lives. There is no conversion, there is no salvation, there is no righteousness, there is no transformation. If we're going to have the benefit of the word and the profit of the word, it is when we hear the word, we analyze it, we apply it to our lives, we believe that word, and then we meditate. When you get back home, you think through, how does this apply to me? What have I learned today? What lesson have I learned therein? What change shall come upon my life as a result of what I learned tonight? It says his delight shall be in the law of the Lord, in his law. Lord shall he meditate, does he meditate day and night. That's why it says in verse 3, and it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth the fruit, his fruit in his season, his leaf shall not, also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall do what? Shall prosper on the basis, on the condition of meditating on the word that we have learned. I'm looking at Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 97. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Here is the psalmist saying, I really love the word of God. And I meditate on that word of God all the day. Uh, can you see now, some people have been asking and, and you know, wondering why. How can somebody be coming to the Bible study like this uh, once a week and, and it's very regular and constant. And yet, there is no change in that person's life. And there's no evidence of salvation or righteousness. There's no change. There's any difference between now and one year ago in his life the secret is this it's not meditating on the word of god it's not meditating on the word of god how is it somebody comes like this once a week and the faith level is going lower and the righteousness is going lower and the respect for god and the house of god is going lower and it appears it looks like somebody who does not have any touch of god upon his life you know the secret why there's no meditation on the word of god daniel meditated on the word daniel answered my cogitations troubled me my thoughts troubled me and i meditated on the word that's what the lord is calling you on i show that will meditate upon the word we hear verse 99 i have more understanding than all my teachers and for thy testimonies are my meditations i come to the new testament in first timothy chapter 4 first timothy chapter 4 we're looking at verse 15 first timothy chapter 4 we're looking at verse 15 meditate upon these things you see that's the word of god it says don't just hear don't just listen, don't just read, don't just study, meditate, think through about it. How does this apply to my life? What's the implication of this for me? And what will be the effect and the power of this in my life? Meditate, meditate on these things. Give thyself, what's the next word? Tell me out loud. Holy, completely, entirely unto them. That is the things to hear. You, you kind of plunge your life into that. And you allow it to saturate your heart. And to influence your heart. That's the reason why we're not coming here for religious knowledge. 
We're not preparing you for school certificate exam in Bible knowledge. We're preparing you for heaven. And if you're going to get to heaven, we must meditate on the word we're listening to. And the meditation must have a transforming effect, a changing effect in our lives so that it turns us away from sin and it turns us onto righteousness and to the Savior. That's why it says, meditate upon these things and give yourself wholly unto them that their profit may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine continuing them. For in doing this thou shalt shalt both save thyself and them that do what? Hear thee. We're coming back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 7. As we look at the word tonight and we look at what the Lord is telling us on prophetic insight into the times of the Gentiles. Prophetic insight into the times of the Gentiles. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was a Gentile. Cyprus, um, Darius was a Gentile. Cyrus was a Gentile. Alexander the Great was a Gentile. Alex, uh, the Antiochus Epiphanes he was a Gentile. All those Gentile kings, they were Gentiles. And all the time they reigned, all those empires were referred to them as the times of the Gentiles. And now God is giving us an insight, a prophetic insight into the times of the Gentiles. That is, the Babylonian Empire and the Middle Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire. We're going to divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the interpretation of the ferocious beasts. The interpretation of the ferocious beasts. Number two, the invasion of the false beasts. The invasion of the fourth beast. And then number three, the identity or the identification of the final future beast. The identification, the identity of the final, the future beast. I come to Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we're looking at verse 15. Daniel chapter 7 verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit. In the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. What if he did not ask? Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. If he didn't ask for the meaning, for the interpretation, he would have lost that interpretation. But he said, I came near, and I asked and I demanded of him, what is the truth of all this? And he told me and made me to know the interpretation of the things. This is the interpretation he was given in verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. You see, when you study the Bible very carefully, you understand the Bible interprets itself. So we don't have to say, I think the beast represents such. I feel maybe the interpretation is this. Or as I'm, in my opinion, I think that this must be the interpretation. There's no opinion here. And there's no thinking here. And there's not a maybe here. Here is what the angel told Daniel in verse 17. He said, these great beasts, which are four, there are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. Well, if these are four kings, and they are going to have four kingdoms, uh, what's the part of the people of God? What's the part of the covenant keepers, of those who have made covenant with the Lord? What's the part of the children of God, those who are saved, and those who are sanctified, and those who are following after the Lord, and those who belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords are the subject of the kingdom? What will be our part? The angel said, all those kings of the earth, they are going to vanish away. They will come and they will go. They arise and then they fall. And they come alive and then they die. But the kingdom eventually will be given to the saints of the Most High. Verse 18 again. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. And possess the kingdom forever. Even forever and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. 
will possess the kingdom in Jesus' name. You see, it's always the attitude of Daniel. He always sought to find out the meaning of what he saw. The meaning of what was revealed unto him. He was not just a careless listener to the word of God. That we just listen as our people say. That the word will come in one ear and then go out the other ear. No, Daniel was a person that he wanted to know. He wanted to find out. That was the constant attitude of Daniel. Look at chapter 8 and verse 15. Daniel chapter 8 verse 15. And it came to pass. When I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, and sought for the meaning. What a good example, a great example, a model for you and for me. That as he saw the vision and as he had the words, he sought for the meaning. I want to understand this. I want to understand so I can apply it to my life. I want to understand so that I'll be able to take caution or precaution so that the judgment coming upon the unbelievers and upon the world will not come upon me so that I will not take part in the indignation and the wrath and the judgment that is coming upon this old world. That's why he wanted to know. And you must want to know. He wanted to find out his sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I, and I heard a man's voice behind the backs of Eli, which called and said, Gabriel, that's, a, that's an angel, make this man to understand the vision. It was the desire of his heart, wanting to know, wanting to find out that made angel Gabriel to be sent from heaven now to give him the meaning. Verse 17, so he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and I fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall, shall be the vision. In Gabriel said, Understand, thou son of man, because this will come at the end. Look at verse 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee to know. Behold, I will make thee to know. If you have a desire that you want to know, if you are not just coming to the Bible study because that's habit, habitual, you know, I'm just coming because I've always come and I always keep my record clear. I'm always present. Yes, sir, I'm here. If that's not your purpose, if you really come with your heart, with your mind, with the intention, you want to hear from the Lord, then you want to know the meaning of what you are learning. You are not somebody that will be sleeping and dozing while the Bible study is going on. That all the time, all through the time, you are asleep. And then we we'll say, now rise up and let us pray. Then you rise up. And then in the prayer, you say what you have always said. Because, after all, you didn't hear anything. You were sleeping throughout. But if you're awake and you're telling the Lord, I want to get the best out of the world like Daniel, then God will send the spirit of understanding and knowledge to every one of us in Jesus' name. And in your amen there, yeah. in verse 19, and he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation for at the end, at the time appointed, the end shall be. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9 of Daniel. I'm reading from verse 21. Daniel chapter 9 verse 21. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me. When Daniel thought about it, it wasn't just a thinking in the brain or thinking in the mind. It was thinking with prayer. 
He was meditating with prayer. And he prayed about it. Oh Lord, give me understanding. Oh Lord, let me know the meaning of this revelation. Oh Lord, what's the part of a believer in this revelation? And what concerns the nation of Israel in this revelation? Oh Lord, what concerns the Gentiles in this revelation? Oh Lord, what, how do I prepare myself so that all the calamities coming upon the heathen nations at the end of the world will not be upon me, oh Lord? How can I, how can I be at peace with you when the whole world has gone astray? He was praying and meditating at the same time. And then the Lord sent the angel again and touched him. And then it says in verse 22, and he informed me. And he talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come for to give the skill and uh, understanding. He'll give us that skill and understanding in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. Daniel chapter 10, we're looking at verse 10. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to thee. Understand, understand the words that I speak to thee and stand upright. And stand upright. Uh, you know you cannot stand upright if you don't understand the word of God. How to stand. How to take your stand. On compromising against sin. If you don't meditate on the word of God, you are not going to know the danger of sinning. You are not going to know the peril, the judgment that come as a result of sinning. You are going to be as careless as those religious Pharisees in the synagogue. At the time of Christ, he preached and preached and preached unto them. He didn't make any change because they didn't have understanding. And they couldn't stand upright. In fact, Jesus gave the parable of the sower. He said, the sower went forth to sow. And he said, the seed is the watch of God. And when somebody hears and does not understand, then Satan will come immediately and take away the watch that he hears. So that he will not be converted, he will not be saved. But it is when you have understanding of the word, then the grace of God will come into your life, then you'll be able to stand upright in that verse 11. For unto thee am I now sage, and when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. In verse 12, then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, you set your heart to understand. You tuned your heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. I'm come because of your words. I pray that you have this same attitude of Daniel. I said you have this attitude of Daniel. Then you have proper understanding of the word. And the understanding you have of the word will make you to act right and live right and go right in the right direction. And the understanding of the word will bring conviction. And that conviction will lead to conversion. That will lead to consecration because of the understanding that you have in the word of God. Without understanding, your head might be enlightened. Without understanding, you might store up a kind of heavy information, but information that is useless, that doesn't change the life. But it is the understanding of the word that drives you to your knees. And then you're seeking the grace of God, saying, Oh Lord, now I understand. I understand what is coming upon this world. I understand that this Babylonian kingdom that I see now, it will come to an end. I understand that there's nothing that stands forever here on earth. The kingdom and the dominion of the Middle Persian Empire will come to an end. It is the understanding you have that you know that the Grecian Empire that will come after that will come to an end. Even the Roman government that will come after that, it will come to an end. And because there is nothing stable, there is nothing steady, there is nothing lasting, there is nothing enduring here on earth, you will look up to the heavens because you know that is what where you have an enduring treasure, an enduring inheritance. 
That's why the understanding of the word is so very important. And I pray that God will give us that same heart of Daniel in Jesus' name. And we're looking at uh, we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 11. Let's say the attitude of these New Testament believers. They were born again, they knew the Lord, and they heard the word of God, like you are hearing tonight, coming to the Bible study. And then what did they do after they heard that word? That's why they were strong. That's why they were steadfast. That's why they lived sanctified, holy, pure, righteous lives. Because of their attitude to the word. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. I'm reading from verse, reading from verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. More noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. As for receiving the word of God, they received the word. They received the word with all readiness of mind. But they went beyond that. They sat quietly listening to the word. They concentrated listening to the word. They took in the word while they heard. They assimilated what they heard. They meditated on what they heard. They went beyond that. In that verse 11, it says, in verse 11, and then it said, and they received with readiness of mind, and they searched, and they searched, and they searched the scriptures daily, not only Monday night. They searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. That means that after the Bible study, they were not giving to church, 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 talking, talking, talking. They were not giving to being talkatives. They were not giving to business as usual. After they heard the word, they kept on searching the word. They kept on studying the word on their own. They, they kept on looking over the outline again. And they kept on applying the word of God into their hearts again. That's what brought the change. That's what brought the transformation. That's what brought the sanctification after the salvation. And then he tells us in verse 12, Therefore, many... Therefore, that means as they sought, as they examined, as they looked over the word again, it says, therefore, many of them believed, and of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. We're looking at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 23. James chapter 1, we're looking at verse 23. It says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, if anyone be a shallow, superficial hearer of the word, and there's no intention to do, there's no commitment to do, there is no consecration to observe. And apply the word. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. That wasn't Daniel. Daniel never forgot because he sought to have an understanding because he sought to have the application of the word in his life and his cogitations and thoughts were on the word. But the people that do not search and dig deep into the word to understand so that the word can have a changing, lasting, transforming effect on them, they'll just be as they were before they came to the study. I pray that will not happen to you in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 8, I'm reading from verses 11 to 12. Luke chapter 8. Verses 11 and 12. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are those that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest 
they should believe and be saved. Our intention of studying this word of God is to get saved and to get sanctified and to get ready and prepared for heaven. We're not interested in just studying, just having knowledge that doesn't get us to heaven. We want to get saved, get sanctified, get holy and pure, get righteous before the Lord and get to heaven. That's what we study. And so, if we're going to have that purpose and that intention fulfilled, we must make sure that we study to profit. And I pray the word will profit every one of us. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. The angel gave him the interpretation of what he had seen. And Daniel took that to heart. Daniel chapter 8, we're looking at verse 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. At the time appointed, the end shall be. Verse 23. And in the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, understanding dark sentences, shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully. And shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft, deception, deceit to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Who is the prince of princes there? Jesus Christ, but he shall be broken without hands. He's talking about that one that will eventually come and fight against the children of Israel. And then even will fight against Christ because he is Antichrist. Yet he shall be destroyed and he'll be broken and that without hands. Come back to chapter 7. Verse 21, talking about this final one that will come. Explaining all these successions of beasts and kings that will fight against the way of the Lord. And then how the Lord eventually will deal with them. Chapter 7 of Daniel verse 21. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. And you have found that all the time we'll be saying about these kings, they prevailed against the children of Israel. How did Daniel get to Babylon? Because Nebuchadnezzar fought against Judah and Israel and prevailed against them. How did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get to Babylon? Because Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the Gentile king, he fought against the people of God and conquered them. And eventually then, the Persian people took over. And they had their laws and their edicts and their decrees. Again, it was still to oppress the people of God that they should not pray to the God of heaven. And then Alexander the Great also rose up, the Grecian king, the Grecian emperor, and fought against the people of God. How about the Roman Empire? The same thing. In fact, at the time of Jesus, when Jesus was still here on earth, the Roman Empire, they were still ruling over the children of Israel. And that's what he's saying here. The succession of kings in their various kingdoms of the gentle era, they'll be fighting against the people of God, the Israelites, and they will conquer them. And then it says, when will that end? Will the Lord just permit them to keep on fighting against them forever and ever? Will there not be any victory at all? Verse 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed. The time came that the saints did what? possessed the kingdom. The Gentile kingdom will not forever overcome. We, the people of God, will be the final conquerors in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now. The invasion 
of the false beast. The invasion of the false beast. Welcome to Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 19. Daniel 7 verse 19. This is the fourth beast. I've told you about the first Babylon. The second Middle Persia. The third Greece. Now we come to the Iron Kingdom. That is the Roman. In verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. He said, thank you for what you have taught me. Thank you for what I know about the first and the second and the third. Now I want to know, I desire to know the truth and the interpretation of the false beast. You see, Daniel, you wouldn't stop. You wouldn't say, after all, if you get three out of four, that's 75% already. I think I've got enough. If I don't understand the rest, that doesn't matter. Not Daniel. You know, there are some people that say, I may not understand everything. I may not hear everything. I may not know everything. But at least I know, I know part. I know some. And that one is enough. That's not enough. He's giving us the whole world. And he wants us to understand. He wants us to know the whole thing. And that's the attitude Daniel had. And we're going to have that attitude in Jesus' name. By the way, many churches don't study chapter 7 to 12 of Daniel. They just say it's clumsy for them. It's confusing for them. They don't even make any effort. They say they can't understand. They only study chapters 1 to 6 and after that they go to another place. But like Daniel, we want to understand everything. And we're going to understand everything in Jesus' name. As the Lord is explaining to us and is unraveling everything to us. Are you understanding? Are you having understanding? Yes. What if we didn't study it? What if we said, beast, lion, leopard, and diverse one, having iron teeth, close that one and go and study Matthew chapter 5. What if we did that? We'll not be able to have understanding. But that's why we're here, that God will give us understanding in everything. We're looking at verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse, that means different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And then we're told in verse 20, And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the others which came up, and, but, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, horn, horn, that had eyes, and a mouth that spake great things, whose, whose look was more stout, more fierce, more terrifying than his fellows. Then in verse 21, I beheld the same horn representing the king, the final king of the extended future Roman Empire, representing that a ferocious and violent and wicked, fierce king that will come eventually. And Daniel 8 calls him the king of fierce countenance. And I saw that on made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. And let's go to chapter 8, chapter 8 verse 9. Describing this false beast, describing this final power of the Roman Empire, and describing the little horn, is called by different, different titles and names, describing this evil one, this violent one, this fierce one, this ferocious one, that will come. It tells us in chapter 8 verse 9, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed a sitting great, Toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. The pleasant land there. You know what land that, that land is? What nation is that? Israel. That's Israel. And uh, that it will fight against the pleasant land. And then it says in verse 10, And it was great, even to the host of heaven, he'll try to fight against God. Think about that. That a human king 
will arise here on earth. And this human king will fight, will try to fight against the almighty God. And will replace God, actually, will try to replace God, that Satan incarnate. That's the one in whom Satan will dwell. And Satan will control him, will motivate him, will direct him, will energize him, will give him various thoughts against the almighty. And here it says that he will wax great and even fight against the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stand, and stand upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. He magnified himself. He'll try to compete with Christ. That's why he'll be called the Antichrist, opposing Christ opposing God. And I told you before that uh, according to the word of God, that spirit of the Antichrist is in the world already. And there are people that will not be satisfied and they will not submit to the rulership of Christ, to the authority of Christ, to the lordship of Christ. And they will fight against Christ like a messenger, like an ambassador of the Antichrist, operating by the spirit of the Antichrist and the Lord eventually will conquer them and destroy them. I pray you will not be like that. Be good. Amen. Verse 11, ye, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And then in verse 12, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. Because the children of Israel themselves had transgressed. They had sinned. They had gone astray. Because of that, they will not be able to have the courage and the power to overcome this beast. But it says over here, and it cast down the truth to the ground. When the Antichrist eventually comes, that's what he will do. And the messengers of the Antichrist today, the forerunners of the Antichrist today, that's what they try to do. They try to cast the truth to the ground. But God will help you, you'll keep the truth. And it practiced and uh, prospered. We're looking at chapter 11 verse 3. Chapter 11 of Daniel, we're looking at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, And a mighty king shall stand up. It's still describing this fourth beast. Ferocious, different, terrible, terrifying, and the one that will strike horror, terror in the world when eventually comes. And a mighty king shall stand up. That shall rule with great dominion and do according to what? According to his will. It will be self-willed. It will not be submissive to the will of any other person. He will not accept any other authority. It will be by himself and will not accept the will of the Heavenly Father, the will of God. All he will know will be his own will. And that's why, you, you know the world in which we are living today. If you look around you very well, almost in every community, in every country, in any society, you find people that are self-willed. That they just say, I don't listen to anybody. I don't uh, bow to anybody. I don't submit to anybody. And no matter how plain and clear the words may be, they say, well, I hear you, but I'm going to do what's in my mind. That's why I told you the spirit of the Antichrist. Because the one that is to come, that king of fierce countenance, he'll have this as the characteristic of his life. He will do according to his will. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, but he that cometh, he has not come, but he's coming. He that cometh against him shall do according to what? According to his own will. It is the fourth, it is the false characteristic of the Antichrist when he comes. He will do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land. He will even go to Israel. He will not have any respect for the God of Israel. He will not have any respect for the laws of God in Israel. He will go to that glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. He will bring real devastation. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, And the king shall do, shall do what? 
according to his will. We're told in verse 3, according to his will. In verse 16, according to his will. And in verse 36, according to his will. He will not bend for anybody. He will not bow for anybody. And if you find yourself that whatever word of God you hear, the word of salvation, the word of repentance, the word of restitution, the word of righteousness, if you find within yourself there is something on the inside saying, no, I will not accept the word of God. I will not bend to the word of God. I will not repent of my sin. I will not be righteous. I'm not going to worry myself about restitution. I will do what I want to do. Let the consequence come. You find that is the characteristic of the Antichrist. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. When he comes, this mighty king, this beast of a king, the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things, blasphemous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation shall be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Look at verse 37. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. He'll think he's wiser than his father. He's more intelligent than his father. Even when the father is saying, my child, what do you know that I don't know? Where have you been? I've not been. Look at this word of God. Look at what the word of God says. He doesn't have any regard for the God of his fathers. And the desire of women... The mother may plead with tears on her face. And he'll just say, I don't care about it. And if you cry, you're just crying for yourself. Nothing moves them. Neither the firm authority of the father, nor the gentle pleading of the mother will move them. And that means that those people, they're having the characteristic and they're having the spirit of that Antichrist that is to come. And then it says, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And let's come to the New Testament now. We're looking at Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The Lord gives us very clearly in the New Testament this personality that is to come. What he will be and what he will do when he eventually comes. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. I'm going, let's go back to verse 4. Verse 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. He'll exalt himself above God and then he would oppose the way of God. And then it says in the verse 4, all that is worship. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what he will look like when he comes. He wants to be worshipped. He wants all attention to be drawn unto him. And he wants everybody to bow down to respect. And he honors nobody. He regards nobody. He respects nobody. Not even the God of heaven. He wants to be God that everyone will worship him. And then he tells us, and he says that he himself is God. In verse 7 now, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth or hinders will let or hinder until he be taken out of the way is because the church is still here. It's because the Holy Spirit is still here. That's why he has not come in full force now. That little horn, that king of fierce countenance. But after we are gone in the rapture, he will come to this world. But will be gone before he comes. And when his saints go marching in, in the rapture, you would have gone. I pray the real, real antichrist will not meet you here. I said the Antichrist will not meet you here. And I also pray there will be no little Antichrist in your family. A little, you know, when, when you have a child in the family that, you know, the father will talk, the mother will talk, the senior brother will talk, the senior sister will talk, and then the preacher will talk. Everybody will be pleading, get saved and repent and go the way of the Lord. And says, no, I will do my will. I don't want to get saved. 
That's your religion. I'm above that. That's a little antichrist in the family. I pray you'll not have little antichrist in your family. That the will of man, the human will, that you'll want to borrow and want to submit to the will of the antichrist, God will crush it out in our families in Jesus' name. I pray we'll not have little antichrists in our church. When you have somebody in the church that we're hearing the word of God and we're studying all this, that antichrist is coming and that the spirit of the antichrist is the spirit of stubbornness and self-will. And yet we're told we study from Genesis to Revelation and we open Old Testament, New Testament and everything is so plain and very clear. The fellow will still say, I'll do my will. Say what you want to say. And preach what you want to preach. I will not repent. That's a little antichrist in the church. And I pray that God will deliver this church from those antichrists in Jesus' name. That God will melt every heart. And that the heart of men and women and children and youths and teenagers, that God will melt every heart and will submit to the Lord in Jesus' name. Because if we're going to take part in the rapture, there must not there must be nothing of the antichrist in our heart, in our mind, in our character. We must live the life that will show that the spirit of Christ is in control, and the spirit of the antichrist is not in control of our lives. Give me a good amen. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let us or let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with his brightness, the brightness of his coming. We're looking at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, when that Antichrist eventually comes, here is what he will do. Here is what the action will be, what the attitude will be. And I pray that as you learn all this, you will not submit to that Antichrist. You'll submit to Christ. You'll be a convert of Christ, a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, a saint of God in Jesus' name. We're looking at Revelation chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 5. The kind of talk he will talk. And the kind of bragging he will brag. And the kind of boasting that he will have. When he comes, Revelation chapter 13 verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That is, three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. And his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven, and it shall be, it was given unto him to make war with who? With the saints, to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and uh, nations. When the Antichrist comes, it will not just be uh, having dominion, authority only on Israel. It will be upon all nations and tongues and dominions and the whole world. But God will deal with him. I say God will deal with him. Let's look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 19 and verse 20. Revelation chapter 19, verse 19. And I saw the beast. This is the same beast who I've been following uh, through in, uh, from Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 11. Here is the beast again. I saw the beast. And the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into where? Into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. I pray you'll not be under his control. You'll not be under his authority. 
Because those who are under his control, under his authority, they will go to that same place meant for Satan and his angels. I will not be there. I said I will not be there. By repentance and righteousness will not be there in Jesus' name. I come to point number three. The identity or the identification of the future beast. The identity or the identification of the future beast. We're looking at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 23. Daniel chapter 7 verse 23. Thus he says, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse, different from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. You know, there are some people that will say when the Antichrist comes, he would only war against Israel, only fight against Israel. They say Africa is not concerned. They say that uh, even the West, that like Britain, like America, they are not concerned. It will only fight against Israel. But look at that verse again. Look at that verse 23 again. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon, the, upon earth which shall be diverse, different from all kingdoms, and shall devour, where? The whole earth, and shall tread the whole earth down, and shall break the whole earth in pieces. In verse 24, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are the ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse, different from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the most high. Do you see how many times we are reading this? How many times Daniel is reminding us? Well, on one side, he's telling us something. He's telling us something. Number one, he's telling us, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if you find a human being, a little fellow. If you find a creature here on earth speaking against the Almighty God. Against the Son of God, against the Word of God, against the dealings of God with man, against the plan and the program of God. Don't be surprised because there is one coming, and that one coming, he will say it for the whole earth to hear the little, little ones and the miserable ones that are following after Satan today. They say it in a corner. They do it in a corner. But when this Antichrist comes, he will do it everywhere. And if that bothers you, then get ready for the rapture. So that when this Antichrist will say it blasphemously against the Almighty God over the television, over internet, over the whole world, you will not be here. I said you will not be here. How do you feel if somebody stands in front of you and insults your mother and calls your mother a bad name, terrible name, shameful name, disgraceful name, and paints your mother like somebody not to talk about? How do you feel? You feel very bad. Am I right? How do you feel if somebody comes to you and then he says some terrible, unprintable words against your father, as a father? Miss terrible things, blasphemous things, shameful things, dirty things that you shouldn't even hear and says that about your father. How do you feel? Do you feel good? You feel very bad. How will you feel if the God of heaven, your creator, your redeemer, the God of gods and the king of kings and the lord of lords, when somebody comes and he speaks blasphemous things against him, you will feel like you are torn apart. And that is what the Antichrist is going to do. He's not going to respect the feeling of anybody. The children of Israel, they respect God, they honor God so much, they cannot even pronounce his name. If you go to Israel, they refuse to pronounce the name Jehovah. The Almighty God, the Most High. But when the Antichrist comes, this great name they exalt, and this great name they respect, they honor. This blasphemous king of fierce countenance, he'll blaspheme that name without blinking an eye. 
And that's why the time of the Antichrist will be a terrible time. And as sometimes today when, you know, young people, when they come in the public and they say blasphemous things against the Lord Almighty, I don't suppose to know God and respect God, those of us who are really saved and born again, will feel it like a dagger in our heart. Am I right? And that's why if you have a little antichrist at home and, and you're seeing the way they talk about our God and the way they talk about church and the way they talk about the Bible and the kind of dis- disrespect and dishonor they have. And you know that, hey, there's a little antichrist and this is a little person that is speaking blasphemy against God. It's a dagger in your heart. You want to do everything you can do to say, hey, you are following after the footstep of the antichrist. Come back and stop that and repent so you can be saved. There's still salvation today, forgiveness today. If a person continues like that in the path of the Antichrist, it will perish forever. I pray you will not perish. We're looking at that uh, chapter, at that chapter 7, and I'm reading now in verse 25, and he shall speak great, great words against the Most High. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change times and laws, and shall be and it shall be given him, and shall be given into his hand until a time one year, and times two years. That's three, and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years. In verse twenty six, and judgment shall sit. The judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it until the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and shall obey him. I pray that you will be part of that kingdom in Jesus' name. In chapter 8 of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, the when transgress are come to the full a king of fierce countenance that's the man again that's that king again that's the antichrist again in prophecy before he comes a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall be mighty but not by his own power it will be satan energizing him it will be Satan invading every part of his heart and life. And it says, but it's not in its own power. It shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his, through his policy also, he shall cause craft and to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy how many? Many. By peace. And you know, there are some people that facially they look gentle and they'll be walking sluggishly and slowly, and it looks so nice. And when they speak out the words, so they don't shout like we shout. And it, they're not boisterous. They're not fun. They're just very nice and cool and very gentle. But inside their heart, the wickedness is there. That spirit is there. That self-will is there. They may not even argue publicly. They may not even, you know, oppose anybody openly. They don't, they're not confrontational. That's how the Antichrist will start. He'll be a kind of person that welcomes people and draws people and embraces people so that with that kind of pretense, he'll be able to deceive people. And as so, you know, sometimes uh, you watch your children at home and they look so gentle and so submissive and if we say it's your child born again oh my child she's born again he's born again and then when you hear that they do something terrible you say no cannot be my child and when you investigate you'll find that thing was done is true you say my child what happened have you been deceiving me all these years because at home you read the bible you sing the songs are so gentle that's what you're talking about it's not just the facial appearance of gentleness it's the real salvation the righteousness in the heart and i pray that that real experience that will make us live a righteous life within and without the lord will give to everybody in jesus name 
And it's not only the children, not only the youth and the teenagers, even the adults too. There are some times that if you look at how gentle some people are, officially, superficially, you'll say this one is a real sanctified child of God. And it's not even saved. Because of this characteristic of the Antichrist, that by peace, by gentleness, by softness, it will deceive very many. I pray you'll not be deceived in Jesus' name. How I pity and, you know, we almost say weep and cry and pray for those who have gotten married. Just some men that, you know, when they approach, they look so gentle. It appears that, you know, they say, I've been looking for somebody loving and peaceful and gentle and patient and long-suffering. And I've got, I don't even need to pray. This one, this one, this one is good. This one is great. And then after the marriage... After one week, two weeks, and that man beats life out of her, wanting to kill her. You say, what? Before we married, you were so gentle. What changed you? No, nothing changed him. He has always been advantaged like that. You only pretended so as to get you into the bondage of marriage. That's why you pray and find out. What's the will of God so that nobody by superficial gentleness will deceive you? You'll not be deceived in Jesus' name. Here yeah, we're told in the word of God that if we're not careful, such deception will be there. Look at that in verse 25 again, in chapter 8, verse 25. And through his policy also, it shall cause crash, deception to prosper in his hand. And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be, tell me, broken without hands. Chapter 11, verse 31. Daniel chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 31. In verse 31, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. They bring abomination. It will not come to our church. Verse 36, And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. And then it goes on to say, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And now he tells us in verse 38, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with God gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things well when all these things shall be happening where will you be when the antichrist will be on earth where will you be when the antichrist will be troubling everybody on earth oppressing everybody on earth where will you be i will be with jesus i will not be here at that time if you are ready for the rapture you will not be here what would do so as not to be here? One, we get saved, genuinely saved. A kind of salvation that is real. A kind of salvation that gives us a righteous life. A holy life. You get sanctified. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. He that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Let's look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. It says, take heed. Watch your life. Watch your behavior. Watch your action. If you do not have the real salvation, biblical salvation, a kind of salvation that makes a person righteous and pure and holy, go back to the altar. 
and kneel before the Lord Jesus Christ and confess your sin and forsake your sin and have real conversion, real salvation. And then it says you take it yourself that the, care, that the cares of life will not swallow you up so that they come upon you unawares. In verse 35, as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape. We will escape. I said we will escape. I've shown you all that the Antichrist will do when he comes, that a king of fears, countenance that will blaspheme God and stamp upon the people and war and fight against the people and want to destroy the saints of God, that is the children of Israel. And all the people who are here at that time, his dominion will be all over the earth to devour, to destroy, to devastate. But then it says now in verse 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all this sin that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man will be with the Lord. I said will be with the Lord. Why don't you then rise up and pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't want to be in this place when that future beast, when that king of fierce countenance, when that antichrist will come to rule in this world. I don't want to be here at that time. Whatever is happening here on earth now, I want to have the experience of real salvation, experience of real sanctification, experience of holiness, experience of walking with the Lord. I don't want to have the self-will. I don't want to have the spirit of the antichrist. Christ. I don't want to be a person that is hearing and hearing the word of God and yet will never change, will never repent, will never turn and will never have salvation. I don't want to be here when that antichrist will come. Don't you believe the word? Don't you know that days of the unchanging, infallible, eternal word of God and that it's going to happen at the end of time and days of the end right here now. You want to call on the name of the Lord that the Lord himself will have mercy upon you. That you will not have the spirit of the antichrist, the life of the antichrist, the behavior of the antichrist, the blasphemy of the antichrist, the opposition of the antichrist, that you are going to live a lie today that will show that you are a real child of God. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. We have heard the word of God. We meditate on the word we have heard. We don't just hear the word of God and throw it away. We don't just hear the word of God and store it in the head. Apply it to your life. And determine that the grace of God will be mighty in your heart. That you have the spirit of Christ. The spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. That will fill your heart with peace, with love, with joy. That the character of Christ will be reproduced in you. So that when Christ will come, you'll be ready to go with the Lord. Pray that you'll not just be a religious Pharisee, a religious Sadducee, a religious churchgoer, just coming to church, nominal, superficial, the word of God having no effect, no transforming power. Pray that the Lord will make you respect and honor God. That all the shallowness and pretense, the Lord will take it away. That your life will be so convincing to bring other people to the Lord, even before you preach to them. That the light of the gospel, the life of a real new creature in Christ, will be so visible, manifest constantly in your life, in your heart. No pretense, no hypocrisy. And you will live the life that will draw other people to the kingdom of God. You meditate on the word. Meditate on the word. Meditate on the word. Are you in the kingdom of Christ? Are you submissive to Christ? Are you yielded to Christ? Fathers and mothers, are your children born again? Or do you have little, little antichrists at home? Little, little antichrists in the church? Youth leaders, what kind of youths are we raising up? Are we leading them to salvation? Are we influencing them to honor God, to respect God, 
to bend the wheel out of the mighty God? Are we just having youth ministry and we see the traits, the character, the characteristics of the Antichrist in them? Parents should be concerned. Leaders should be concerned that everyone identifying with this church shall have real, real salvation, not religion. We have studied it tonight. The Antichrist will come and he'll do terrible things, indescribable, unthinkable. And we have seen the central characteristic of that Antichrist will do according to his own will. If you are like that, you are not a disciple of Christ, you are a disciple of the Antichrist. Salvation will take that away from you. Conversion will take that away from you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. If you are born again, you will love the word of God. You will accept the word of God. When you've done something wrong, something you didn't uh, intend, but you find it to be wrong, you delight in correction. You delight in the teaching of the word of God that will bring you to the path of righteousness. There's something you are that hates teaching, doctrine, righteousness, holiness. That's not of God. The spirit of the Antichrist that motivates a person to hate the things of God and to fight against the things of God. Pray that the Lord will subdue your will to his own will. Then will you be able to pray with sincerity that will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Such people do not act like the Antichrist. Pray that God will get you ready for the coming of the Lord. So you'll be a saint, a child of God, righteous, pure, and holy. And when the Lord shall come, you'll be among the saints, among the elect, that will go with the Lord. Meditate on the word day and night. Observe to do according to this word day and night. Live by this word of righteousness day and night. Pray that God will help you. You will not be a nominal church goer, superficial church goer, religious Pharisee, Sadducee. Not be somebody that cramps the Bible in the head, but it's not in the heart. Pray that God will help you to have the life of the new creature, new creature in Christ. Not just um, outward peacefulness, outward gentleness. Outward serenity, inward, the righteousness that is based and built on principle is in the heart, and then you leave it out. And people around you can see that you love the Lord, you follow the Lord, and you live according to His word. And you'll be like Daniel. And thereafter, every day, searching daily to deepen their experience in the Lord every day. And their lives and your life will be pleasing unto the Lord Almighty. Pray that God will help you to live a life pleasing.